this is, this is a pretty good room. Uh, I'll post a picture later, but actually the, um, in the green room, they had like this incredible array of musicians and performers and things that have been in this very room on this very stage. So it's a huge honor to be here. Um, you got a little bit of an introduction, but my name is Matt Mullenwick. Uh, you can find me, my main blog at ma.tt, my photo blog at matt.blog, and if you want to tweet anything during these events, um, at photomat on the important and other major platforms. Uh, being in Europe, this is actually the first time, as you know, this is, I think, six WordCamp Europe? Is that right? And every previous time, I've done primarily a town hall Q&A or an interview style. Uh, but there's so much going on this year that we have a bit of a presentation. I just have a lot to share with y'all. And being in Europe, I wanted to highlight one thing in particular. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you will have noticed that there is a new link in the footer of the WordPress.org and Foundation websites. That is a link to something called public code. Da, da, da. There we go. Um, anyone heard of this before? We have a couple. I want everyone to be aware of it, because this is something I've been pushing for in the US at the local, uh, state, and federal level, and this is the European version. Basically what it's saying is that when public taxpayer money is used to buy software or create software, shouldn't that belong to us? Right? <laughs> and it, <laughs> Also, when you think of the amount of money that goes into open source development now, and the scope of what that's been able to affect uh, with WordPress, certainly, if you imagine even just a small fraction of the national budgets <laughs> going into open source software being directed there, I think we could have like a Cambrian explosion of kind of open source solutions. In addition to all the other reasons that you all know why open source is great. If two cities in different parts of the world or if different parts of Europe are doing the same thing, there's no reason they should create two completely separate solutions for things. So allowing them to share their code and maybe search and replace, you know, Paris with Belgrade, <laughs> but use the same software would be really handy. Uh, so check this out. It's now being linked. Uh, I think this is very, very important uh, for the world today. Second thing I wanted to announce for y'all is, um, as you know, in the US versus in Europe, we change the location every two years. So I'm very proud to announce that the host for WordCamp Europe in 2019 and 2020 will be the lovely city of St. Louis. <laughs> this follows Nashville in that I've never been to St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking forward to uh, checking it out and learning and exploring a new part of the country that I haven't been to. And of course, hope to see many of you there if you're able to make it over to the US. Uh, okay, let's get over to core. Uh, there have been, since the WordCamp US in December, six core releases. So things have been going along. I wanted to update you on the four major focus areas as well, since that's how we've been oriented development. If you remember at the beginning of 2017, we shifted from being kind of a release lead model to kind of a focus area model. First of these is customization. Exciting things going on here is we figured out a way to basically turn widgets into Gutenberg blocks, sidebars into post contents, and have done some mock-ups and some explorations for uh, selecting page layouts. As you know, the editor part of Gutenberg is going to be phase one. Phase two is customization and moving to editing the entire website. So that has already kicked off under progress, and there's some exciting things coming. The WordPress CLI. Who uses WP CLI here, just out of curiosity? Nice. Yeah. So very excited that this became a core, kind of officially adopted project. It had two major releases, and version 2.0, which changes some of the packaging to be easier for distribution and dis dependencies, is coming out in July. So keep an eye out for that. The REST API, in addition to a little bit of security work, <laughs> Uh, we've expanded a lot because, as you know, Gutenberg is built entirely on the REST API, so every part of it is working. So we did some work around search and autosaves to make sure, basically expand uh, the APIs to ha support our first party usage. The nice thing about this is that when we're able to use them ourselves, it also means that other third parties are probably likely able to use them better as well. And then finally, I want to talk about the mobile apps a little bit. 
Um, that team's been making a huge investment into right-to-left support and accessibility, including supporting native uh, OS things like VoiceOver and some of the other things that Android and iOS provide. They made it so when you make a post, you don't have to wait and watch it. It uploads in the background. I just want to highlight that 1.3 million posts and 3.7 million photos have been posted via the mobile apps in just the past month. So they're starting to become a very major part of how people interact with WordPress. On the accessibility front as well, I think it's worth noting because I consider, based on all the assistive technologies available on PCs, Macs, iOS, and Android, these to actually be the most accessible ways to interact with WordPress today, and I think that will continue in, in the future. It's just the tools are better around making things uh, accessible with, via these apps than the tools like JAWS and other things that are kind of trying to hack into web browsers. But I know you all want to hear about Gutenberg, right? <laughs> uh, just to review a little bit, we've accomplished a lot with Gutenberg thus far. Um, the major features that are in it thus, so far are we have a block-based writing experience with over 20 blocks built in. Gutenberg is fully adaptive, meaning that when you're looking at it on a small screen, a medium screen, a large screen, a huge screen, <laughs> it, the design and, and functionality adapts to be fluid and easy to use on any of those. There is... Da, da, da. Da, da, da. Ah, there we go. Optimized for direct manipulation of content. So we're bringing it closer uh, to where what you're editing looks a lot more like what you're seeing on the front page. We have a block API with support for static and uh, dynamic blocks. This is one of my favorite, the universal API, which is copy and paste. Who's ever tried to copy and paste things into the WordPress editor or any place else and it just goes kind of sideways? Um, Gutenberg already has support for fully supported copy and paste from Google Docs, Apple Pages, everyone's favorite Microsoft Word, Office 365, Evernote, Legacy WordPress, Random Web Pages, and then finally, something I know will be very popular with this audience is Markdown. And that's actually what you're seeing in this little GIF there, is a uh, copy and paste from a Markdown source, whether that's a node editor or wherever you want, you paste into Gutenberg, it translates it just instantly into Gutenberg blocks. It's very, very slick. If you haven't tried this yet, highly recommend trying it. It's one of my favorite hidden features alongside, I'll tell you my other favorite hidden feature, which is that when you, um, copy and paste a URL onto some text that auto-links it. Saves a ton of time. There's templates with predefined blocks. So this is starting to go into where uh, you can see hints of where we're gonna end up with full site customization with this, which basically allows you to create for your users or for yourself um, kind of pre-built layouts where you can say, okay, a title goes here, an image goes here, some text goes here, a map goes here. Um, that can be reused over and over again or assigned to entire pages. There's shared blocks, so if you do want to reuse things across the entire site, that can be a shared unified resource, so when you edit it once, it shows up everywhere. And finally, I'm very excited about that we have nested blocks and child blocks. So these are blocks within blocks, like it's turtles and blocks all the way down, and uh, child blocks which only work if the parent block is there, perhaps like your children. Media drag and drop, uh, extensions where you can add extra things to the sidebar. We have this beautiful Hello Belgrade extension here. Overall, there's been 30 Gutenberg releases all, uh, since we started, and 12 just at WordCamp US in December. Uh, as you can see, this is kind of running through all the different releases. There have been over 1,700 issues opened and 1,100 closed in the Gutenberg project thus far. Um, and from the development point of view, I'm very proud of it. We have open development, design-led testing, iterative releases, presentations across pretty much every WordCamp now, including here, it's developed a wide awareness, uh, support and awareness from every single uh, page builder out there. Um, you know the names. We already have people extending Gutenberg. Uh, through plugins, they're starting to get some good pickup in the directory. And major sites, so agencies and others, have been building and launching things with Gutenberg. Uh, because, to be honest, it, it works. <laughs> it's not perfect yet. We're not ready to release it yet. But for the things it does, it does them well. And you can actually just send the site using this in production already. 
There are now 14,000 sites actively using Gutenberg. So this isn't just installed, this is actually active. And just released this week are tools for um, enterprises. It's one called Gutenberg Ramp, which is a new plugin from VIP, which basically allows you to turn Gutenberg on for certain post IDs, page IDs, or content types. So that way you can start to phase in. Let's say you have a, a really complex uh, sort of setup of WordPress, and maybe certain post types or things have uh, extra customizations, you can start to turn Gutenberg R for parts of it, not for others, uh, to get to the point where you have everything on and fully done. But the question I'm going to preempt, so you don't need to ask it, is what's coming next in the world of Gutenbergification? Which is just kind of fun to say. It sounds almost like a German word, right? Here's the roadmap. So these are things happening in June, which means they are highly eminent. First, we're going to freeze new features coming into Gutenberg. We've reached a point where there is a functionality that matches and, in fact, in many areas exceeds what we accomplished with the legacy editor. Um, we're going to encourage host agencies and teachers uh, to start opting in folks that they have influence over to start using Gutenberg, uh, very much especially if it's someone who you're working with closely so that you can start to gather feedback from third-party users of it, people who aren't involved with the development every day, and pass that back, of course, to the developers. Uh, this is to complement the user testing, extensive user testing that we've already been doing. One of the hosts that's going to be uh, sort of contributing to this is WordPress.com. So there's several hundred thousand, and uh, the high hundreds of thousands uh, folks on WordPress.com that actually use the WP Admin interface primarily. So we're going to be offering them a call to action and an opt-in so they can start using it very soon. One of the key metrics we'll be tracking there are the number of sites and the number of posts that are using this. And then finally, the mobile apps, which I like said, which I said are getting more and more popular. Right now, if you move between editing things in the mobile apps and Gutenberg, it breaks in a pretty spectacular fashion. <laughs> so within the next uh, few weeks, that will be all fixed up across both iOS and Android. Coming up in July, there's going to be a 4.9 point something release that has a strong invitation in the dashboard, uh, the first time we've done this, to either install Gutenberg or the classic editor plugin. So basically, we'll be encouraging people to get on the train early, or if when 5.0 comes out, your site's not going to be ready for it, install the classic editor plugin, for, for those who don't know. Basically, locks in your site to use how the WordPress WYSIWYG and editor works today. So it kind of opts you out of Gutenberg. Uh, we're, of course, going to be tracking the use of both of those. <laughs> we're going to switch to opt-in for WP Admin on .com to be opt-out, and then tracking who opts out and trying to gather as much data from them as why, because there's there going to be a lot of information there, especially from people who might be using third-party plugins on WordPress.com. Be a heavy, heavy triage and bug gardening, getting all the blockers to zero. And then finally, we're going to actually kick off and maybe even branch off uh, the customization leads to start, start the work for what we want to launch hopefully this year, which is more of the full site editing experience of Gutenberg. So in August and beyond, we'll have all critical issues resolved. It'll be integrated with the Calypso interface on WordPress.com, which is where the majority of people use it. I want to have 100,000 sites, 250,000 posts that have been made so 100,000 sites active with Gutenberg, so over 10x where it is today, or about 10x where it is today. And with a quarter million posts, I think we'll be able to say that a lot of the, <laughs> the bugs will be worked out. We're going to merge into core, and then a 5.0 release cycle. So beta releases, translations, and then finally, we are planning, there's work undergoing, it's not ready yet, but there will be full mobile versions of Gutenberg by the end of the year on the iOS and uh, Android app. So by August, it won't break when you move between them. And of course, Gutenberg is done in a way that makes the content and the markup backwards compatible. Um, but we're actually going to have the blocks supported in the mobile apps so that as you drag and drop blocks, move them around, have different sort of fun things you can do, that'll all be there. We could have a 5.0 as soon as August. Some of these things that I put up there, I'm very, very sure about. The big thing that we're not sure about is as we vastly increase kind of the aperture, the usage of, of Gutenberg across hopefully over 100,000 sites, what's going to come in? And uh, the non-determinate 
non-deterministic nature of fixing bugs means that I don't know exactly of the issues that get raised, whether they're going to be small tweaks or whether they might be sort of huge things that are going to require a few weeks of development. Um, that is why I can't promise you a date. Uh, but we've done a lot of testing thus far. So the nature of bugs that we find, if there's no black swans in there uh, of bugs, um, I do think that 5.0 is going to be ready within a relatively short time frame. And that's all I got. <laughs> so thank you very much. This is the... <laughs> We do have time for questions, if you're up for it. Excellent. We've got a mic over here. We've got a mic on this side. Please queue up and come bring your questions for Matt. Hey, so I think if you, yeah, if you walk over, there's one there yeah, you got to stand up. We don't have mic runners today. So you'll see one on this side of the room and one on this side of the room. Please come on down. I hope after all that, y'all are excited about Gutenberg coming as I am. Hello. Uh, I was wondering, is WordPress is getting acquired by Google as what happened with GitHub and Microsoft and what the ads full tracking company like Google is doing at this event? Because also I heard today that only deep debugger for Gutenberg is going to be Google Chrome. And the second question is WordPress.org is not open source anymore. Yesterday on Contributors Day, I wanted to commit solid MVC standard supporting camel case at plugin names uh, and uh, by the WordPress meta team lead, I was told that this part of WordPress.org is closed source and will never be open sourced and will not be able to commit suggestions like camel casing. Thank you. Wow. Okay, don't go away because I'm going to ask you something about your first question because I didn't fully understand it. So nothing on WordPress.org has ever gone from open to closed. <laughs> it started off as fully closed and then we've been opening it up as we kind of go through and clean up code remove passwords, you know, get rid of all the Illuminati conspiracy stuff. Um, and that, that's why, I don't know about this particular area, you said there was something around camel case and... Yes, camel case is not supported and uh, the solid MVC PSR4 autoloader standard says that we should support camel case at plugin names and this is not supported. I suggested it and I was rejected because this is closed source and I cannot commit a suggestion to this part. It's like, I was like fully rejected because I cannot suggest. <laughs> well, I think, I don't know whether the, that suggestion was rejected because they disagreed with camel case, as I do. I don't know they, if they, they felt they like love that. It. They love it. Uh, but we said it's not a priority and I cannot put into a priority list because I cannot suggest. Like, like you cannot suggest and you cannot get upvotes on this. Ah, well, drop it in the meta bug tracker anyway, even though the code isn't directly example. There's no reason not to have it in the meta tracker. And there it can be discussed, debated, and you know the code will happen if it's agreed on. On the first part, I didn't get, there was something around tracking in Google that I didn't understand. Yes, the Google company is tracking everybody. Like uh, now, this time in Serbia, I was not even right able now? to. Yes, in Serbia, I was not able to log in to my Gmail with Outlook. I was asked to log in to Google website. So this is a new thing. Google is pushing me like Facebook to read the messages on Gmail. So so that's a bad thing. And I was wondering if it will happen the same as what happened with the GitHub. I trusted in GitHub, and they are sold to Microsoft. What will happen with the with the with with WordPress, it will be sold to Google or not? Yeah. <laughs> That's an amazing way to thank our sponsors. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot embedded in there. Uh, so where to start? Uh, well, the good news is that Google can't buy WordPress like it bought GitHub because WordPress is not a company or a thing that can be bought. It is, you know, there's WordPress.org, there's the WordPress Foundation, there's all the code that's open. I don't think the code behind GitHub is open. Um, so even if, let's say, let's not say Google, let's say some sort of evil corporation uh, somehow, <laughs> somehow bought something, I don't know, automatic, something that is viable. Um, you know, anyone in here in this room could download WordPress 
and rename it not evil code press and um, move on. And in fact, that's how WordPress itself started. It was a fork of an existing open source uh, project called B2 Cafe Log. Uh, that forked because it had been abandoned, not because it, there was any sort of philosophical difference. Um, but that's one of the bo great beauties of open source, is that when you build something on an open source foundation, it can never really be pulled out from you because the sort of fundamental rights embedded into the open source license, the GPL, that we hold, all hold uh, near and dear, uh, prevent that. So uh, regardless of whatever corporate machinations or tracking or whatever goes on, uh, open source code belongs to you as much as it belongs to me or anyone else here in this room, and you have control over it. So thank you very much for your question. Before Josefa hops on, I'd love to just put it out there to our live streamers. If you have questions from abroad, please send them to us over Twitter, or we can probably get one or two in. Awesome. Sh should they use the hashtag for that? They should probably use the hashtag for that. <laughs> WCEU. Very cool. Uh, my name is Josefa, and I actually have a question about Gutenberg. It sounds like you've made a whole lot of progress and have a lot of features in it. Is there a particular feature that um, you are excited about, or one that you wish were in there that's not in there yet? Hmm. I kind of gave it away already, <laughs> which is the copy and paste. It is, um, I find myself enjoying different writing environments for almost different states of mind or different tasks. So sometimes I'm coming from simple notes where I'm writing more plain text, or sometimes I'm writing markdown. Uh, I use kind of every place. Um, there's uh, Scrivener, there's like all sorts of different places where I, I enjoy writing sometimes, even Google Docs. And so the experience now of bringing those over into Gutenberg uh, without really needing any sort of API integrations, you know, WordPress.com has a Google Docs integration, but honestly, it's a little clunky to move between things. And so it's one of my favorite things. Do you, do you have any favorites? The Don Quixote feature? <laughs> Templates. And why do you like templates? Yeah, templates are great. Matthias just said how it kickstarts things for users. So basically, you don't just give someone a, a blank canvas. It, it t trains, turns what might be just a purely blank canvas, which can be very uh, challenging, to almost more like a color by numbers. You can express a lot of creativity within certain lines uh, and create something really great which is one of the things WordPress has always been fantastic at. So, all right, thank you very much. To the left, and it looks like there's no one, oh, there is someone on the right. Hi. You just popped up there. Yeah, I, w I waited. Pop-up question. Uh, I just wanted to hear your opinion about uh, the future of combining the web circuits uh, technology with uh, web apps and uh, the way to use, I'm gonna invent a term, a multi-hybrid app and a web app that is uh, functioning as a complete app for the app store and uh, for the Android app store and also managed in the same platform and on your site, on the WordPress. Yeah, it's a good question. We're, um, we're going in that uh, idea, theoretically, mm -hmm. trying to develop something. So we're trying to hear your opinion about the future of this development. I mean, there's very exciting technologies coming out of uh, two big corporations, one of which is a sponsor of WordCamp Europe. Thank you, Google. Um, Facebook has React Native, which, you know, as more and more Gutenberg is completely built on React. As you know, there was a question about a switching licenses and moving away from it. Um, they changed the license of React to be GPL uh, compatible and remove the patents clause, and we decided to stick with it. It's been really great. And there's some other things and tooling built around that that we might be able to leverage a lot more in the future. Um, I've definitely seen some really cool experiments going on with React Native. And if it, it's, of course, what powers, for example, the Calypso desktop app. The other thing coming from Google, which is very, very exciting since they also you know, contribute to the largest open source browser, which is Chrome, um, progressive web apps. So there's lots of technologies around there that I think could drastically speed up how WP Admin works in a way that makes it a much more applied experience without it actually needing to be completely rewritten from the ground up. So I feel like there is an opportunity to get sort of almost like a, a JavaScript app-like performance increases from WP Admin in a mostly backwards compatible way 
uh, with progressive web app technology. So that's very, very exciting. It's also open standards that are being supported by many places. Um, so I feel like there was a time there when it looked pretty dark, to be honest, for the web, uh, particularly when performance. Things were just going slower, and of course we know users start to tend, they tend their uses towards things that are faster, so the in-app things are winning. Uh, but between AMP, progressive web apps, and just all the improvements and optimizations that we're making, including things coming under the hood, like PHP 7, basically doubling performance of WordPress overnight. Um, it saved me more than 70% 70, 70 on the server's service wow. expenses. <laughs> I, I don't know why any host is not moving everyone to PHP 7, because they'll neither. save hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous how much faster it is. So these things are, are making it so we can have a really competitive experience, and I'm excited about the future of the web. I have a dream of managing a website and an app, a cross-app, hybrid app, on the same platform. Could it be possible? There's going to be... I don't think it's possible today, to be honest. Today, not. There's... For example, as we do Gutenberg on mobile, we're going to want blocks that are registered by plugins that work both on the web and within the apps. It's not clear how or if that will be able to work today, um, but we'll use WordPress's influence and our best of our knowledge and coding abilities to try to get something there where we can actually have some commonality. So being able to have plugins for the app that you're using on your phone, again, that's not something that you really see with other apps. Okay, thanks. No problem. How about over here? Uh, my question is about the timing for 5.0. Uh -huh. um, at least in Europe, August uh, is typically a very slow month <laughs> for companies. Plenty of time to upgrade. Uh, so it, it would be kind of difficult uh, to uh, actually get the decision makers in the companies to set up an appointment, discuss, mm -hmm. you know, uh, upgrade plans and so on and so forth. Wouldn't that risk of, you know, giving uh, skewed statistics about how many people would actually switch to the Gutenberg versus classic editor because many people will just play it safe, mm -hmm. have a nice summer, and uh, <laughs> deal with it after it. I think a summer with Gutenberg is way better than a summer without it. Um, I don't know what y'all's idea of vacation is, but <laughs> the, uh, I suppose that could be something. Um, there's a lot rest of the world. Um, there's a whole southern hemisphere that'll be in winter <laughs> during August. You know, there's. Um, there's America where we never take vacation. <laughs> There's places all over. Um, and so I guess we'll keep an eye for that, affecting the numbers. But like I said, I don't actually think it's the worst thing in the world if you install a classic editor for August, came back in September, and um, you know did a TANS installation <laughs> of the latest Gutenberg in 5.0. I think that would be totally OK. So I, I'm not trying to rush y'all. <laughs> Um, it's just we want to get the improvements out there as soon as possible because, and one of the points I tried to make in that previous slide, which I think I didn't really articulate fully, which is that even though 5.0 is coming out hopefully in August, that there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of sites using Gutenberg actively before then. So if you're a plugin developer, a theme developer, and you have things that aren't yet compatible with Gutenberg, get on that right away. That should be basically your highest priority because you're going to start to see the early adopters of Gutenberg plugin are going to be kind of the best and brightest customers, maybe the ones spending the most money with you. So you want to make sure that that is uh, kind of fully up to date as we move into that. Cool. Thank you. I've got a question from our live stream, if you will, Matt. Sure. This is coming from Aaron Jorben, who asks, <laughs> how long do you expect the Gutenberg API to be frozen before the final release? And is a stable API necessary to build developer trust? I expect the API July-ish, so when we do that, um, when we start to branch off the customizer, one of the things that allows us to build some of the customization stuff is a stable API in Gutenberg. So maybe a little after the feature freeze, but way before uh, the release. Cool. Thank you, Aaron. We miss your bow tie here in WordCamp Europe. All right, let's go over here. All right. Uh, hi, Matt. Greetings from Munich. Um, I wanted to ask about GitHub which is uh, probably evil now. Um, I think <laughs> most of the uh, last features, uh, big features like uh, the REST API, uh, WCLI, and now Gutenberg, who had developed on GitHub with the mm -hmm. issue tracker and all 
podcast and stuff like that. Um, so when do you plan to abandon track? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> wow, we have a range here. We have Microsoft is evil, we need to move. We have Microsoft is good, let's switch to GitHub. Um, you know, I, I actually don't have any issues with any of the companies that have been mentioned thus far. I think things are often a lot more nuanced. Um, in terms of uh, GitHub, I think it's been a really fantastic place, and one of the advantages of keeping Gutenberg a plug-in as long as possible, like I'm in no hurry to do the core merge, um, is that you know, kind of the, the things on it have allowed for a really rapid pace of, of iteration. I mean, the features I just talked about is kind of equivalent to what we did like the past five or six years in core. We've really been able to move really fast uh, with this. That's not only because of GitHub, though. It's, it's a function of the technologies we're building on, doing something from scratch, the fact that it's a plugin, so we want to release frequently and get feedback, the people working on it, the amazing contributions that have come from people in this room and not in this room. Um, I'm also interested, you know, it's, uh, it's public that I'm on the board of GitLab, which is an open source, uh, not just competitor to GitHub, but that does a lot of other things, including DevOps integrations. And so we're keeping an eye on that. I would say that we're evaluating tools. Track has stagnated a bit, uh, but there's lots of others in the marketplace. I think Gitia is another one, if anyone's come across that. It's used by Go, uh, or it's written in Go, used by the Free Software Foundation of Europe and others, that I think are worth evaluating. But I put all that in the bucket of meta work, like things that we don't really need to, um, to make to ship Gutenberg, and things that aren't necessarily going to help our users um, you know, into getting this out as soon as possible, and not even going to help like plugin developers and other people who are, who are already developing on their sort of place of choice. So it's on the list, just further towards the bottom. All right, thank you. No problem. Hi, Matt. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of the Cape Town WordPress Meetup, and one of the questions that I get asked the most by attendees is, what was the problem that you were wanting to solve with Gutenberg? Oh. Um, well, almost everything that we showed there is something that's showed up in user testing or in personal frustrations of developers and folks in this room. So, I mean, the beauty of Gutenberg is, no, okay, here's the problem that the foundation of WordPress that has now served us well for 15 years will not last the next 15 years. I don't think there's anyone that disagrees with that. Uh, when WordPress started, there was barely any JavaScript in the entire application. In fact, I think we called it DHTML, if anyone remembers back in those days. Uh, Gutenberg not only provides a modern interface that leapfrogs um, the best of what all the modern web builders and uh, website creators are doing out there. It provides a, a development framework and foundation that I think will become the basis for everything we do in WordPress. You know, if you notice, Gutenberg is JavaScript talking to APIs. Uh, you might remember in 2015, I stood in front of you at WordCamp US and said, learn JavaScript deeply. Yeah, who's been doing that? Few people. <laughs> okay, I'll repeat it. Please learn JavaScript deeply. Uh, JavaScript is the future of WordPress development, uh, particularly on WP Admin and plugin side. And so uh, Gutenberg brings in a way to do that, as we've shown, that we can move really fast. So that's the fundamental problem. We're solving lots of user issues along the way. And if you watch, you know, the team posts some of these videos where they do user tests. Uh, to, the, to the P2s and things. They're really fascinating and eye-opening. Or if you don't want to watch one of those, just sit someone who's never used WordPress before or someone who is very fluent with WordPress and ask them to do something like create two columns. Right? <laughs> Ouch. If you, don't know pay, if you don't know HTML and a bit of CSS, you're stuck. That is so basic much less being able to customize your site the way that people imagine, outside of you know, taking a theme but then going beyond that. And so, you know, our mission of WordPress is to democratize publishing. That's a problem I've been working on for 15 years. I hope to work on the rest of my life. Uh, Gutenberg opens us up to an entirely new audience and continues along this mission. <laughs> All right, over 
right here. Yeah. Mr. Mullerbach, hi from uh, Amsterdam, Sebastian. I have two short questions about world domination. <laughs> <laughs> Number sure. one is what can we do, according to you, as a community to get Gutenberg adopted by every, uh, yeah, rememberable CMS in the world? Hmm? That's number one. And number two, how can we, after that, get all the people to WordPress? So first we switch to other CMSs to Gutenberg and then we switch them to WordPress? Okay, yeah. that's sneaky. It's like the Trojan horse. In a way. <laughs> um, you know, other CMSs adopting Gutenberg is up to them, but uh, it's been cool to see some explorations there thus far. Um, I've just seen discussions. I don't know if it's gone beyond that, but I know the Drupal community is taking a look at Gutenberg. Um, also, there's others that are building their own things inspired by Gutenberg, which I think is pretty cool as well, because for a long time, I have felt like this kind of block-based approach um, is the best way to edit the web, because it really takes advantage of the web as a native medium, of uh, something that can bring in elements from many different places. And we've been stuck for far too long in this kind of document-based editing. Uh, so I think the best thing we could do to get other people to adopt it is just make it as awesome as possible. Uh, WordPress's market share is already pretty commanding within the open source CMS space or the CMS space in general. So they're watching everything we do already. Uh, to make this transition be successful, which is kind of the other part of your question, is going to be the best reason to get more people adopting Gutenberg, which we made open source because we want everyone to adopt it. Uh, you know, meetups, WordCamps, friends and family, whoever you can show Gutenberg. And as I said, I believe it's ready to start installing the Gutenberg plugin for them, walking them through it, uh, showing them some of the cool features that I just showed you up here. Uh, you know, finding out your favorite parts of it, just like I got that question. Like, figure out what your favorite part of it, because that, it, that enthusiasm is infectious. And uh, that's how WordPress itself spread largely, you know. There really wasn't any significant advertising in the WordPress space till last year. So everything prior to that was basically word of mouth. It was people like you here in this room telling your friends, family, clients, developers, anyone who will listen whether they wanted to hear it or not <laughs> about how cool this WordPress thing is. So uh, use Gutenberg ramp, use the Gutenberg plugin, try to get as many people running it as possible. Like you said, as a community, we have this goal of 100,000 sites, 250,000 posts. Um, the sooner we get there, the sooner we'll identify all the things that'll make the next version of Gutenberg better. You had a part two, right? Yeah, how do we make sure that the people go to WordPress after when oh. they switch to Gutenberg? You know, to me, fundamentally, I want people on an open source CMS. So if they're on open source, to me, that makes the web a better place. And, uh, and so if they're adopting any of the open source, uh, us or the compatriots, I think that is good for the web and good for the world. Um, so adopting WordPress in general, one thing I think we can start to do more of is think about the entire user experience around WordPress, not just the things that happen when you log into WP Admin. Think about all the steps that might lead people there, from the moment they might Google a term to signing up with wherever they're gonna host it, the, you know, the onboarding process, the unboxing process of WordPress is something that we often forget about because we all did it three, five, 10, some 15 years ago. It's been that long since we were a brand new user. And so putting ourselves in the shoes of those new users, which again, might be Googling around, might be seeing lots of ads on the TV for Wix and Squarespace to really understand why WordPress is different, uh, why it's gonna be around longer than any of those other ones, and then how it can solve their needs, which is probably not, they didn't wake up in the morning saying, I want a CMS. They probably said, I want people to be able to find me online I want people to make reservations for my restaurant. I want to tell people or show people my work, my photography, my creativity. I want to write and reach an audience. These are all, WordPress is a means to an end there. And so we need to show everyone how it can help them accomplish those things. Exciting time ahead, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
when it might become back-end agnostic, but curse you Amsterdam, you still my question. <laughs> so uh, my new question is, what is 6.0 going to be focused on? <laughs> ah, well, I guess if we get back on our three releases a year, 6.0 comes out in, yeah, like 2021, 2022. So 2021. Hmm. I don't know. To, to be honest, my hope is that 6.0, Gutenberg lining up with 5.0 is a little bit of an accident. Like it's, and it's a little bit frustrating. Like if it were 5.1 or 5.3, like that would be a little easier in terms of getting things out beforehand. As you know, we're putting some enhancements in 4.9 just to kind of close the gap between when Gutenberg's ready and this 5.0 number. Um, but you know, the changes that'll come in 5.1, 5.2 are going to be just as significant as Gutenberg because we'll be moving outside of just the editor and the page, page and post editing, to really allow people to customize their entire site using Gutenberg blocks. We're going to take things that have been in WordPress for 12, 13 years, like widgets, and eliminate them. Menus. These are all going to flatten and all be different types of blocks that you can use anywhere in a post page or throughout the site layout. Um, I consider this as significant as the original introduction of themes, uh, which came in WordPress 1.5, I think. You know, the idea that there's now a new way to build and design something that people are going to bring their creativity to changing. When you can move around everything on the page, that's a different way of building a theme. And I'm really curious what kind of creativity and approach people are going to bring to it. So I would say that the releases to watch out for are 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3, because they're going to be just as significant as 5.0 uh, for what's coming. It's this next phases of Gutenberg. Hello, uh, I'm Martin. Um, so the latest version of WordPress rolled out the GDPR compliance features. I thought we were uh, going to make it the whole time. Which, uh, <laughs> which uh, just the team that worked on this should get all the applause they can get for actually getting that rolled out. <laughs> I think you might know where this is headed. <laughs> so we, as a community, had to make WordPress work with this new legislation. Mm -hmm. And it's one of many legislations that are happening around the world. Mm -hmm. We were not part of that conversation at all. Uh, yesterday, there were meetings at Downing Street that had people in it <laughs> that were representatives of people in the web community, but we were not represented. There are meetings in Washington, there's meetings in Germany, there are meetings in France, there are meetings everywhere where we, 30% of the web, are not represented mm -hmm. in any way. Now, we had a conversation about this six months ago, mm -hmm. and I asked, how do we make a structure to communicate our intent to the people who make decisions? And you said, just do it. Can I have a different, more structured answer than that? <laughs> <laughs> I was prepared for this, and um, I've been informed by uh, my legal counsel and lawyers that I need you to accept this cookie <laughs> before I can answer this question. Okay, now that you've accepted the cookie, uh, we can get on. <laughs> I knew GDPR was going to come up. I would say it's not entirely fair to say that we're not represented at all. What I, uh, folks, folks that advocate for the open web and for WordPress are in some of these meetings. And they are meeting with folks from Brussels, with folks in DC, all over the world, um, and doing the best to make the case for the open web. Uh, what I will agree should be happening more is some documentation of that. However, that can be difficult because sometimes these are closed door meetings. Sometimes they're kind of off, you know, it's, it's kind of background meetings where legislators are saying, hey, what do you think of, we're considering XYZ, or XYZ is going to happen. So, do know that there is some work happening. 
In terms of official WordPress representation of these things, um, I don't have that much of a better answer for you. <laughs> to be honest, I've been focused really hard on Gutenberg. <laughs> And I have had the luxury of almost completely ignoring uh, everything where the letters G, D, P, and R are <laughs> So I apologize. I know that's not the most popular answer in Europe. Um, let me know what happened, what you tried in the past six months. You know, we'll meet up afterwards. And, uh, and what didn't work, why it hasn't happened over the last six months. There's uh, sort of a, I think, even more powerful than having people at the meetings is having a policy that's published on our website that we say what we actually want. I think that's the hard part. I mean, part of why we don't have the person at the meeting is because I don't know what the WordPress community wants that person to represent. And so let's work on the policy, and then you know either that can affect us, impact it without there being a meeting, or we can have someone that goes and you know wears a WordPress shirt and yells about the open web of these things. Cool. Thank you very much. I'll and allow it. Hope you enjoy the cookie. I knew I should have let Morton go last because that was epic. Uh, <laughs> but let me squeeze one last one in. We'll close with a Gutenberg question. Uh, sure. I was curious, because uh, you talked about getting feedback from agencies, from teachers, mm -hmm. uh, and having us be a part of that area of process, getting uh, actual use cases into this process to make sure we're not missing anything, there's nothing else to be done. I'm wondering if you have in mind some kind of a formalized process around that, besides just raising tickets, conversations, meetings, a web form, I don't know, something. We have some testing plans, right? Uh, maybe you pass the mic to Tammy. <laughs> right, this is Tammy Lister. You want to introduce yourself real quick? Hi. I'm Stand up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. A lot of people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So at the moment, we have a feedback form, and we will, as we get more people that we want to kind of get feedback for, we can expand that to have lots of multiple different ways that you can give feedback. At the moment, we have the support forums. We also have Slack. We also have the feedback form, but then we can kind of expand that. So there will be ways, and there will be obvious ways that you can get feedback. What's probably the best place for people to go to see that, like make, make slash Gutenberg, make editor? Uh, so yeah, on um, we're gonna we've just changed the f um, what was flow to core test channel, so that we're gonna try and rejuvenate that channel a lot. So core uh, test is probably the best place to go for that. But there is the feedback form also with if you have the Gut Gutenberg plugin still. And how about this is like a, a request? Do you think uh, since we're entering this phase now at dot org slash Gutenberg, we could put a little link to that for people who want to do testing? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. That'll be awesome. So we'll, we'll have like a little feedback form and a link to this Slack channel uh, right there. And you will be interacting with real live Gutenberg developers and designers and contributors and everything, uh, seeing things get made. Well, that's all the time we have. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Serbia. Thank you, Belgrade. Thank you, Europe. Thanks, Matt. We love it. <laughs>